All righty. Good morning. We might make a start. Thank you all for coming, supporting the, uh, the Summer Scholars. Uh, my name is Tom Rogers. I'm a historian in the military history section here at the War Memorial. Um, I work on projects dealing with Australia's frontier uh, colonial conflicts, the Boer War and the First World War. And I do a lot of the, um, the research and writing of uh, LPCs, the last post ceremony um, that we have every evening. Uh, this morning, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting this morning. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, the memorial is committed to honouring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's unique cultural and spiritual relations uh, to the land, uh, the waters and the seas, and their rich contribution to Australian society. So the uh, Summer Scholars program has been running uh, since 1985 at the War Memorial, uh, making it the longest running of the Summer Scholars programs uh, from the cultural institutions in Canberra. The scholars that we're meeting this morning are the 92nd, 93rd and 94th to, be, um, to have come through the memorial. So we're getting close to 100. And the main, I suppose the main feature of the War Memorial's Summer Scholars Program uh, is that when the scholars come, we actually assign them a project. So what you're seeing is the results of six weeks of very intensive uh, research and work by our Summer Scholars, uh, which makes it quite challenging for them, but I think it also makes it very exciting for them. Uh, as well. Uh, we have summer scholars or former summer scholars working here in the memorial now. Others have gone on to uh, academia, um, teaching history, working in public institutions uh, in Canberra and, and elsewhere around Australia and abroad. I'd like to thank uh, the director, Dr. Brendan Nelson, and the assistant director of public programs, Anne Benny, for their continued support of the summer scholars program. Um, I'd also like to thank the finance section and especially Kira Hopkinson, uh, the travel officer, for organising the travel and accommodation for our scholars. The staff of the Research Centre put on a lovely morning tea for us uh, this year. And I'd like to thank especially uh, Dr Eric Carpenter for showing the scholars through, uh, through the vast holdings, the archival holdings of the War Memorial. This morning is the first time we're going to be filming the presentations of the Summer Scholars. Uh, and they, they, those films will be available on the YouTube uh, website, uh, the YouTube channel of the um, Australian War Memorial. So this morning, I'm going to ask each supervisor to come up and introduce the scholar. The scholar will speak for 20 minutes on her project, and then we'll have about five minutes of question time after each uh, presentation. Um, and at the end, we, I'll ask the director to come up and present the scholars with their certificates. Uh, so first off, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Aaron Pegram to come up and introduce Daniel Broadhurst. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, before I kick off, can I just remind you all to turn your phones either off or switch them to silent, please, uh, out of respect, not just for your fellow audience members, but for our speakers here this morning. Uh, as Tom mentioned, um, I was uh, the supervisor for Ms. Danielle Broadhurst, and um, as a supervisor, she made my job exceptionally easy. Um, Danielle uh, it, it looked at this relatively unknown period of the Australian Imperial Forces combat experience on the Western Front, which neatly falls between the end of the Third Battle of Ypres in, in late 1917 and the start of the German Spring Offensive in March 1918. Uh, if you have a look in the in the First World War official histories or in Anzac to Amiens by C. E. W. Bean, that's uh, neatly a, a time in the in the storyline of the Australian Imperial Force that we switched to operations in Sinai and Palestine. This period is generally uh, overlooked as a period of uh, of uh, a relative inactivity, and as Daniel will soon tell us, it was was anything but. So Daniel Broadhurst completed her Bachelor of Arts uh, with honours at Monash University last year and where she researched venereal disease regulations on the Melbourne home front during the Second World War. And this year, Daniel will commence a Master of Cultural Heritage degree at Deakin uh, uh, in just a few weeks' time. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Daniel Broadhurst and her, and her paper, Recovering the Trenches, the Australia Corps in the Flanders Winter of November 1917 to March 1918. 
In the time between November 1917 and the German Spring Offensive in late March 1918, the AAF was said to be resting at Messines on a relatively quiet part of the front. Lieutenant George Mitchell of the 48th Battalion described this period as uneventful. Sleet and snow would follow him back to his billets near the town of Metteren, where the friendly peasantry might have been their own. He describes those glorious weeks of training and sports as going smoothly, the sun shining more brightly every day. Mitchell's fond memories are the prevailing and simplified view of the Australian troops' time spent in the Flanders winter of 1917-18. to And by being simplified, details are often misunderstood and confused in books such as David Cameron's recent Australians on the Western Front, 1918. The AIF's perceived inactivity during this period is often passed over in accounts of Australia in the First World War, using this juncture to switch to the narrative of operations carried out by the Australian mounted units fighting in Palestine. But what was this period like for the Australians who remained in Flanders during the winter of 1917 and 18? Was it bleak and miserable like the Somme winter of the year before, or did it offer a new host of problems for the AIF? In light of the exceptionally heavy casualties that had been suffered by the Australians during the Third Battle of Ypres just months earlier, how did the Australians recover and prepare for what would be their final year in the Great War? In this presentation, I propose that the final period of Australia's wartime experience should not be dismissed as a period of inactivity. In looking at how the AIF spent this relatively quiet period of its campaign on the Western Front, we see a more nuanced account of what life in the trenches was like. Against the backdrop of declining enlistment and dwindling manpower, how did the AAF use this period of relative inactivity to prepare for the fighting of 1918? By the end of 1917, the AAF had endured some of its heavy, heaviest fighting in the war. In just one year, they had to taken a total of 166,000 casualties, of which 15,000 had been killed in action. This accounts for about 45% of the total number of Australians who died on the Western Front. During this time, the AAF had fought in major battles at Bullecourt, Messines and the Third Battle of Ypres in Belgium. And as a result, the Australian divisions were short by some 18,000 men by October. More men were needed for the front, but voluntary enlistment was on a downward trajectory and showed no signs of improving. Enlistment dump numbers were down to as few as 5,000 men a month when the minimum need was for 7,000. A campaign for the second conscription plebiscite was in full swing, bitterly dividing the nation between yes and no. And the position in France and Belgium was often used to highlight this desperate need for reinforcement. Russia's exit from the conflict and the subsequent dissolution of the Eastern Front led to an anticipated German offensive, as Germany would soon move over a million troops to the Western Front to achieve a decisive breakthrough. On the 17th of December 1917, a mere three days before the nation would cast their vote on conscription, but eight weeks after it was written, The Age published a statement from General William Birdwood expressing his need for more men and his struggle to bring the divisions back up to strength. It's noted within the article that the urgency of this situation should set the minds of Australians straight, that on Thursday they should vote in favour of conscription and alleviate the AAF's crisis. Despite the seriousness of the situation for the AAF, the plebiscite and the introduction of conscription failed for a second time on the 20th of December 1917. While the Australian population remained divided on the issue of conscription, the AAF did its best to reorganise under a new structure known as the Australia Corps. The proposal suggested organising a corps to remedy the issue of manpower fatigue and shortages. The decision to separate from the New Zealanders was one not made lightly, given the shared experiences at Gallipoli and the fighting during 1917 and 1916. However, the men felt that they were sent to where they had always wanted to be, and that was with the rest of the Australians. The Australia Corps was then formed on the 1st of November under the command of General William Birdwood and consisted of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 5th Australian Divisions. The 4th Division was the most battle-worn and subsequently became a depot for reinforcements and eventually rejoined the Australia Corps in January of 1918. Having fought at Messine throughout June and July 1917, the Australians returned to this now quiet part of the front for some time of rest and recovery after the Third Battle of Ypres. This allowed those hospitalised sick and wounded during the Third Ypres campaign to return to their units. Major General John Monash, commander of the 3rd Australian Division, exclaimed in a letter to home, I find myself once again in command of the same sector of front which I captured in June and July. 
The front line was extensive and extended from Hollebeck in Belgium to the north down to Amantiere in France to the south, which equates to approximately 16 kilometres, with a trench length of 12 kilometres. The northern sector, or messine vidchat sector, runs from Hollebeck down to the town of Warnerton, and the southern sector, or plogstier messine sector, runs from Warnerton down to Amantiere in France, just over the Franco-Belgian border. And just for a bit of reference, Ypres is another seven kilometres just northeast of here. The core front was much longer to that which they had previously been accustomed during the Somme winter of 1916 and 17. Organised into three divisional areas, pair divisions rotated between forward and rear areas, with some brigades being detached from their divisions when organised in the front line. Instead of a continuous trench system, battalions occupied a series of strong points and outposts set up in German pillboxes that they had captured during June. While the position did provide an opportunity for rest, there was still plenty of work to be done in light of the preparation for the expected German offensive. In this respect, quiet sector becomes a relative term and so does rest. This period became an opportunity for training and the development of defensive measures as much as it was an opportunity for rest and recovery. The nature of trench warfare meant that though this period was used to relieve the manpower shortage, men continued to die or became casualty through enemy action and other men found themselves taken prisoners of war. A tendency toward indiscipline continues to follow the Australians and as men were returning from convalescence, others were leaving the front for varying reasons. Operations during this time at Messine were purely defensive in nature. The objective was to maintain the Messine Vidchart Ridge that, and by doing so, maintain the gains that the British and Dominion forces had achieved during the fighting at Ypres. The Australia Corps' position at Messines also deepened defences around the vital railway of Hazelbrook, which supplied British forces fighting in the north. When in a line, a typical day would consist of working in lower areas where night activity allowed for working in open areas, as well as the conduction of raids and patrols. These trenches were most recently inherited from the British and were in quite poor condition. A lot of work would have to be done on making them livable, as it was not uncommon for these trenches to be flooded. Working parties consisted of wiring, digging, laying duckboards and generally strengthening the defences and took place at all hours of the day. The experience of these men along this fast front of some 16 kilometres is varied. Though it was uneventful for some, others found it relentless. Trench raids were common during this period. Conducted by both the Germans and the Australians, the intent was to gather information by taking prisoners or collecting enemy documents. Short, sharp and violent, a raid is considered successful if the number of casualties were fewer than the raiding party inflicted. One raid carried out by the 40th of Battalion in December of 1917 was considered their most successful in the war. In turn, the 10th Battalion was subject to a German raid in March 1918 when they were in the process of relieving the 13th Battalion in the forward area to the north. The 10th Battalion alone lost seven men as prisoners, 16 were wounded and four were killed including Major Horace Henwood, who had only recently returned from his leave in London. He was reported to have been taken prisoner and while crossing no man's land, he was killed in action by a gunshot wound, aged only 28 years old. March 1918 had seen a quickening in the military pulse as the German spring offensive loomed. In the northern sector, the 9th Battalion was subject to multiple gas attacks lasting three to four hours in turn, creating heavy, heavy casualties. One such casualty is Private John Leake VC. His career in the AAF was brought to an end when a particular gas attack rendered him unfit for active service. And a medical report on the 3rd Brigade claimed that men are seriously affected and require a very long rest to recover, but they had already been moved here for that very purpose of resting. And rest was often hard to come by, but was ultimately obtained through a range of varying activities when units rotated in the rear area or in support positions. With rest came access to basic comforts that had been lacking in the months past, an opportunity for entertainment to alleviate the monotony of their trench life, while sports and training aimed to maintain fitness and boost their morale. Accounts of these activities are not isolated to Messine, but occur in rear area towns of Meteren, Nerve Eglise and Bayeux. Weather undoubtedly played a role during this period, but not to the same extent that it had in the winter previous. The Somme winter had been a learning opportunity for the AAF 
to minimise the likelihood of illnesses like trench foot and influenza for the men fighting in these trenches. The environmental condition of, were typical of Flanders during the winter months, boggy from mud caused by a high water table and cold. Sergeant Archie Barwick of the 1st Battalion wrote in his diary, likening the Flanders winter to an average Tasmanian winter with only half the amount of rain. Access to basic comforts was also resting, alleviating the effects of winter and went some way to boost the morale of these troops. The accounts of some men show that they had relative freedom to travel towns to towns in rear areas for their rest and recuperation. Men also had the freedom of putting the war behind them and celebrating occasions more familiar to them in their civilian life. Christmas and New Year's was celebrated with the support of the Australian Comforts Fund and the YMCA who provided them with additional food and gifts. The most enthusiastic of these accounts is provided by Sergeant Barwick, who details food, a bit of whiskey and rum with an evening nap to sleep it off, and night sat around a fire ending in a snowball fight. Organised training and sports programs feature predominantly throughout the Flanders winter. Training was carried out wherever possible with the support divisions and in reserve positions. The intent was not only to hone the skills of these servicemen, but develop more defensive tactics. Example could be made of the training program undertaken by the 13th Battalion from March 1918 at Nerve Eglise. Mornings from 9.30 to 11.30 were dedicated to training and drills, including parade ground saluting, gas helmet drills, platoon drills and muscle exercises, as well as bayonet fighting, musketry, rapid loading and marching. Afternoons from 1.30 to 3.30 were spent in much the same way, with ample time scheduled for their sports. It was the opinion of many that sports were a valuable activity in improving their morale. According to one man, the only remedy for a weary soldier was to be in reserve with fine weather and plenty of sports and amusement. So within the 13th Battalion's training program, boxing competitions were introduced and football matches were taking place at least three times a week. The men played rugby from this 13th Battalion, but Victorian, South Australian and Western Australians would often prefer Aussie rules where possible. Matches helped troops with their morale, provided them with entertainment and increased their fitness and helped men keep in contact with some sort of normal life away from war. Private Street of the 55th Battalion said, Football did more to rejuvenate a battalion than anything else. Food kept us alive, but football made us enjoy living and forget death. The accounts provided by Lieutenant Tom Richards of the 1st Battalion illustrate just how committed these men were to their game. Given his personal success as a professional rugby player before the war, Richards kept a meticulous record of the matches played by his battalion during their period off the line and resting at Meteran in France. When playing the 13th Battalion on the 10th of February, he even notes that this game would be played by rugby union rules, although league was the preferred among the AAF, and on every account his team won. The final component of rest during this period was the allocation of leave to London and Paris, Long awaited by men, leave was a mixed blessing, as was any sort of free time. Desertion and absenteeism were also common during this period and considered an endemic problem. But it's evident that relations with locals while on leave would also become an issue. Regular pay, periods of inactivity and relative freedom in rear areas often culminated in breaches of military discipline. These include outbreaks of venereal diseases, drunkenness and lawlessness. By the end of 1917, the numbers of Australians in prison were six times that of other Dominion troops and eight times that of the British Army. During the course of the war, the British courts martial sentenced 266 men to death for desertion and Dominion troops on the Western Front would face a similar fate. But the AIF members were spared the death penalty if their sentence was not sanctioned by the Governor-General, and it never was. Richard Glenister has suggested that the total number of courts martialed held for deserters from the AIF was around 4,100. While 17% of these would occur within Australia before embarkation, once overseas, one in 100 would desert. This policy of desertion without execution, upheld by the Australian Defence Act of 1903, is regarded as the reason for such high figures. Australia was pressured three times from 1916 to 1917 to change this clause and fall in line with the other military forces of the British Empire. Australia's unwillingness to change this clause was rooted in the public opinion of the war and unpopular response they had gotten from entering conscription. 
it was never going to be a good time and considering the conscription plebiscite's failure, they'd believed it would never succeed. As the war progressed and the AAF suffered a greater number of casualties, they also experienced increasing numbers of desertion. In 1918, the naming and shaming of these deserters was entered with the hopes of deterring the mean from absconding. General Birdwood suggested naming these people in public papers back at home and the first notices from this period under examine appear in the Australian press in 1918, in March 1918. But given these figures complied by Glenister and from the Provo War Diaries, this had little effect. Absconding has two forms, absenting without leave and overstaying leave or outright deserting without the intention of returning. The number of men who absconded seemed to rise as units re-entered the line, even in relatively quiet sectors like this at Messine. The statistics suggest that the numbers were higher at the beginning of this period after the Third Battle of Ypres, but also rose in March as the German activity increased before the start of the spring offensive. Throughout January and February, this period of rest and break, oops, abdom, pardon me, throughout January and February, in this period of rest, the rate of absenteeism does not stop. As Ashley Eakins has stated, absenting and deserting is a sign that these men were weary. Leave became associated with risks other than that of men overstaying their allotted time. Monash wrote home stating that men got into all sorts of mischief, got robbed and often came seriously to grief. One such grief was the contraction of venereal diseases. As stated in the official history of the Australian Army Medical Services, Venereal disease was identified as one of the most important medical problems of reconditioning and was at every phase of work in the war. At any one time during the war, it's been estimated that of the 60 divisions under the command of the British Army, venereal disease would incapacitate one entire division. During the Flanders winter, there was twice as many men taken out of the line suffering from venereal disease than there were absenting or deserting. Evidently, as men took their leave to London and Paris, they might be returning to the front with some unwanted souvenirs. By 1918, the AIF adopted a reasonably coherent strategy against venereal diseases that included Eddie Rout's common sense approach that men should not be expected to abstain from their sexual desires. Instead of discouraging sex practice, Rout, who was a social reformer from New Zealand, promoted safe sex practice and pro distributed prophylaxis to the men when on leave in London and Paris. If this failed, the soldier would be brought up on a charge, resulting in the forfeiture of pay for the duration of his treatment. This is a form of punishment applicable to both officers and all other ranks. The military and sexually transmitted diseases have a long history together and continued to do so after the First World War. Treatment was an inconvenience that would remove men from fighting in the front lines from five to ten weeks. And this military wastage was evidently a bane when the idea of this rest period was to return men from hospital to the front, not to send these men away. Interaction between soldiers and undesirables was the duty of the military police to monitor, but there was also concern for local towns in this period of rest where those threats were not as obvious. And so the final year of the Australia Corps found the Australia Corps relatively rested, their fighting skills honed, fitness improved, the Messine Vitscharda Ridge held, maintaining the Allied hold on the front immediately south of the Ypres salient. For all the defensive measures that were put in place here by the Australians, the effectiveness of those defences would not be known. By late March and early April, the German Spring Offensive began and the AAF found themselves rushed south to defend Amiens, bringing an end to their period of rest and recovery. This study has shown that the time spent in rest and recovery should not be misunderstood as inactivity and didn't just consist of football, clean socks and their comforts, but in the end consists of raids, gas attacks and crime active elements of warfare that challenged the AAF and its ability to alleviate its manpower crisis. The AAF entered the fighting of 1918 with divisions having taken on strength some 14,000 men by reinforcements and wounded men returning to their units. But with 1,287 reported cases of venereal disease and a further 643 court-martialed for either absenting or deserting. Approximately 9,900 men became casualty because of the fighting during this quiet period, which in the end exceeded 
the strength of either the 3rd or 4th Division had after the 3rd Battle of Ypres. As explained by Les Carlin, what the Corps needed was fresh men, not just those whose nerves had been undone by years of fighting. And as Bean put it, the Australia Corps was feeding upon itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. That was fantastic. Uh, do we have any questions? And when you ask a question, can I ask you to speak into the microphones that are roving as we're recording? I'm intrigued a little bit about the men who, who deserted as opposed to de absconded. I mean, um, this... There's presumably a guys who went through the, the turmoil of the third battle of Ypres and then expecting some time away from the front and then they're thrown into this um, muddy, horrible, um, cold, bleak part of the line. So if you can tell us a bit about some of the guys that you found. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of interesting examples that have um, come out. One example is Richard Brett of the Second Division in Company. He was on leave in London during January, so just after this period of Ypres and he would have had some time during the line at Messines. Um, but he then vowed to report back and was AWOL for five months when found in plain clothing and then pleaded not guilty to desertion <laughs> five months later. Um, he was, of course, charged with desertion. Um, there's also an example of men leaving the front line after they're given the order that they're going to be moving into these forward positions. Um, three such men desert from the 4th Division, and even though, oh, pardon, yeah, 4th Division, um, they hand themselves in a number of days later, but because they went AWOL from the front line, they're charged with desertion, and they get quite heavy penalties, around 10 years, some of them, which is then commuted to two, and then often they're back in the line. But there's an example of two of them, when serving their sentence, they then escape jail as well. So. <laughs> They weren't sitting still very long. Um, and there's also the example of Private John Leake, VC. Before he's incapacitated by a gas attack in March, he actually did desert in November. So when he was moving back into the line um, at Brisinda, so before they get to Messines, but immediately after the fighting at Third Battle of Eight. Um, they had made changes to who could enlist, so they were making it easier for men to qualify. Um, in June or July, they had recently passed the half-caste amendment, um, so often you'd get a number of people from that community willing to go. Boys recently turned 18 or 21 when they didn't need their parents' permission, um, but I personally haven't looked into individual enlistment records. But imagine the changing of who qualified would influence it a lot. Danielle, um, You're on. Danielle, did you find any evidence of a systematic training programs um, during this period, which by, I mean, it's um, all right having new reinforcements coming in, but they need to be trained up. And, and do you get a sense that the foundation's being laid for the performance um, of the AIF during the, the summer of um, 1918? Um, I'm not sure about what training program the new reinforcements were going through. Um, there was an Australia Corps school established to the north that was for officers and people getting promoted to go and have some better training. Um, with these training programs that were play taking place in the rear areas, there was also a lot of rifle ranging, ranges established, exercises with grenades, bombs and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure what the new recruits were going through. Daniel, thank you very much for your paper. I enjoyed it. Uh, Pre-antibiotic era that it was, what was the treatment for venereal disease and how effective was it? Um, it was pretty awful. Um, it often contained medication that had mercury in it, for one thing. 
Um, I'm not as familiar with the treatment in the First World War. I'm more familiar with the Second World War, but it was a process of awful lotions and um, retaining and passing of water that had certain chemicals in them. Um, And I don't think it was that effective. I mean, there was obviously incidences of um, relapsing. I came across one file where he's relapsed three times during the course of the war. Um, But, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't pleasant. So I think in part, obviously, the process of treatment would be deterrent enough to be a bit more careful, but then at the same time, no one's really going to be thinking of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Danielle. I think Brendan had a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, do you know what was the reaction in Australia to the name and shame publication uh, of the names? Well, I presume it was a mixed one. Um, I'm not sure because I didn't really have any way of gauging what it would be. I'm mostly going through the documents that are held here at the memorial and I didn't find anything from the home front that might have given any um, impact. I was looking through Trove with the digitised newspapers to find these names of the men from the period um, and it was actually hard to find so I'm not sure how widely spread the publication of names actually was. But no, I don't know unfortunately. Thank you. All right, very good. Can we thank Danielle for her paper? That was, that was fantastic. Thank you, Danielle.